right, everybody. Welcome back to the Weightlifting Life podcast. I am Greg Everett. Uh, with me, of course, is Ursula Garza. And uh, I honestly, it feels like it's been like three months since we've recorded one of these. Is it just me? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. Wow. That was a creepy no, silence no. for a while yeah, there. We've had, uh, we've had a hard time getting our shit together. I actually have a really funny um, exchange of messages from you and I that I almost posted <laughs> when I said that I was going to put, I was going to pencil, pencil in the date. And you were like, put that shit in pen. Seriously, bitch. fucking <laughs> tattoo it on yourself for God's sake. Hey, if any of you ever schedule anything with Ursula, add 15 to 30 minutes and also don't really be that committed to it because there's a good chance it won't happen. Oh, that's happen. so not true. <laughs> it's 100% true. No, I've missed one thing. Oh, God, it's years, so hard just... to nail. We were supposed to start this half an hour ago. Don't try to pretend like this isn't real. I life. needed coffee. Oh my God, me too, but I had it ready in time. All right, guys. Hey, if uh, if you feel like attending one of my seminars, and if you don't feel like attending one of my seminars, uh, you should probably go to the doctor and get your brain checked. Um, you can go to our website, catalystathletics.com slash Olympic dot, or excuse me, dash weightlifting dash seminars, and use the code podcast15 to get 15% off any of our 2017 seminars. And let me tell you, there's a bunch of them. Uh, we got, let's see here, we've got Las Vegas. We've got uh, New Zealand. We've got Italy. We've got Iceland. We've got Nova Scotia. Uh, we've got England. We've got uh, St. Louis, Missouri, and Miami. All right, so honestly, like if one of those isn't convenient Italy. for you, then it's probably your own fault. What's that? Ursula's, Ursula's probably gonna be in Italy. <laughs> Ursula is probably going to be in Italy. Are you talking about yes. yourself in the third person now? Yes, yes. Oh. I'm giving you a directive from someone else. Yeah. Oh, I, I did get a private message from uh, a young man in Italy who, who wanted me to pay him $1,000 to teach the Italian seminar because he was the Italian cloakoff uh, and basically was saying that he would do a much better job and this and that. And... Uh, I don't mean to be mean, but based on what is posted on his Instagram account, I don't think that's true. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and stick with our uh, present coaching staff, but uh, grazie, as they might say in Italy. All right, so Ursula. Funny. Ursula wants to yes. get all weird and talk about boobs right off the bat. I so. do not want I'm to I'm just weird. kidding. I, just, I told I... her I've had that this exact question, and as a matter of fact... I think that I have the only weightlifting book in the history of the written language uh, that specifically discusses this very issue. So I need some and kind of all of those people who declare that they have read it still send me emails asking. So <laughs> I mean, a lot of people haven't haven't seen me, and I always get these really you know they're always from men, and they're very awkward. Like I don't mean to you know. You know, they, they, they start to talk at my coaching credentials. And then I, I really know that the reason they're asking me is because I'm like a little bit beyond a D cup. So I'm big breasted. And so they see me lifting and they're like, I have lifters who have big breasts. And it's kind of like in parentheses, I noticed you had big breasts. <laughs> I mean, and, I wasn't uh, looking. I just, I, I noticed. Or anything, but I just kind of noticed by chance. And um, like they hit their breasts when they're lifting. Do you even have you problem? sound awkward talking about do? it? Just let it go. Huh? I said even you well, sound me... awkward talking about it. They hit their b b breasts. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so they have big titties and they hit their tits and they're snatching. There, there you go. go. There's my real, real speak. There you go. Um, and so, you know, the first thing I tell them is, well, I don't hit mine. And the reason is I actually extend in my pull. If someone is constantly hitting their chest, then it probably means they're not finishing the torso extension at the top of the pool so that the bar clears the chest. It's kind of like almost the same as hitting your forehead. It means you've done, you've moved forward early. Um, or I noticed you, you have a really big forehead. I, I don't. <laughs> and I have lifters with big foreheads. How do you get around it? <laughs> you get around that forehead. Why do you keep hitting it? Um, but so, I mean, I basically tell them, you know, make sure they're extending correctly. And then there's a secondary thing in that, 
you know, if you have something protruding from your body, like a super heavyweight does a belly or a woman with big breasts, the bar path is going to be a little adjusted to make sure that the bar stays in proximity to the body without actually contacting it. The truth is when I was younger and I didn't have much in the breast area, does that sound awkward? <laughs> I, um, every once in a while I used to skim my chest, uh, and I, I didn't really have much to skim, but, um, and it was just because I was trying to keep the bar close to my body. And sometimes I'd get a little brush on my chest, uh, but I didn't actually, you know, hit it. So, um, you shouldn't be hitting them. And I would suggest that you have your athlete work on, you know, making sure they're finishing their extension, getting a consistent bar path that retains proximity to the body without contacting from the hip up and then working on that. Like it, but the answer in short is they're doing something wrong. <laughs> Cause you shouldn't be hitting your breasts. You're fucking it's not, up. it's not natural in the movement to expect that you're going to hit your tits every time you do a snatch. Well, you shouldn't just say, Oh, that's just part of the deal. That's not part of the deal. Yeah, No, that's nonsense. It's, it's exactly like we talked about before we started recording it, any human body has girth to it at some point, And it has some points that are, you know, deeper than others fore and aft. The bar has to go around them while staying as close to it as possible. So if you weigh 400 pounds, you know, if you're a gigantic, super heavy, it's not like you just grind the bar through the middle of all the adipose <laughs> tissue in front of your body. So if, if these guys and gals can figure it out, then if you have big old tits, you can figure it out too. Uh, it's just a matter of having that kinesthetic awareness. Um, and, you know, like I, I told Ursula, I've had plenty of guys hit themselves in the chest too. And if you're not opening up your hips all the way so that we've talked about this position in the past about a million times on this show. Uh, well, actually probably 10 times since that's the only number of episodes we've done. But, you know, if you're extended upward at the top of the second pole, your legs are going to be about vertical and then your hips are hyperextended, which means that your shoulders are at least slightly behind your hips, which means that whatever is on the front of your body, whether it's a belly or, a, you know, a, a pair of fun bags, that's going to be pulled backward somewhat out of the way of the bar. So it's just a matter of the bar and body moving around each other just like would have to happen with anybody. Uh, it's just that maybe yours is shaped somewhat differently, so you've got to get used to it. And I've known, uh, I'm very well acquainted with at least one lifter who, uh, within a matter of hours, went from uh, very little in the way of chest development to quite a bit. And she never hit those things a single time. So, uh, I mean, it's it's just a matter of knowing where your body and the bar is at any given time. Yeah, some kinesthetic awareness helps. That's a, that's a reference to boltons, if anyone's confused about what I was talking about. Robots. All right. Anything else we need to <laughs> add about that? Um... As you can see, no. neither Ursula nor I are particularly shy about uh, discussing anatomical issues. Oh, I would say, well, you said the word appendages. Um, <laughs> I would say um, also to help, uh, because much like running, you're jump, you know, you're you're jumping up and down when you lift, pretty much. So I would wear, I suggest wearing a double bra if they're particularly large, just to minimize and to get them out of the way. I mean, because you don't want to have to go way around your body that creates um, longer displacement of the bar and probably you lose some speed because of that. So um, I don't always, but if I know I'm going to lift, I wear make sure I wear at least one sports bra. Um, <laughs> That's a good start. Yes. Or but yes, bra. strap those yeah. things down. You're not going out for cocktails. You're going to lift. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, we get the same kind of issues with guys. I just will never understand it. I had one guy ask, I don't remember if it was on Facebook or our old form or what. He's like, when you're doing box squats, how do you not sit on your balls? I was like, well, <laughs> put some fucking underwear on you, dumb shit. Like, <laughs> what are you, what are you doing? And so like, if you're walking around in a singlet with a visible fruit basket, like, Get some compression shorts or something because that's going to be a problem. So I feel these are these class things class that I feel like we them. shouldn't have to to explain, but uh, apparently, 
at least a few folks out there <laughs> need some explicit yeah. hand holding on this. Hide the monkey knuckles. <laughs> yes. Hide the monkey knuckles. Uh, all right. So now that we've made everyone uh, sufficiently uncomfortable, <laughs> should we move Perfect. on to the next one? Perfect. We're, we've really broken the ice. Yeah, now we have a question. Okay. Uh, Erland or Erland or Erland. I have no idea how to pronounce your name, Erland, but I think Erland sounds the best. Erland asks, jumping back so in the So if you snatch... don't call yourself Erland, you need to start calling yourself Erland. Erland. Okay. Well, doesn't that, that sounds, it just, yeah, that, well, that, it flows well. Right. Uh, I've known someone named Erlene, but that was spelled quite differently. All right, Erland asks, jumping back in the snatch and clean. Why am I doing it? <laughs> I love questions like this. It's just like a declarative statement. Jumping back in the snatch and clean. Why am I doing it? How much is okay? How do I stop doing it? Uh, the reason I wanted to include this one is for, well, two reasons. Number one, we've talked about jumping forward a number of times. Uh, and that's a really common question because it's a really common error or a symptom of, of quite a few, you know, various common errors. Um, but lately I've gotten a lot of questions about this more and more. And I think largely it's because of, uh, my lifter, Amy Hay, our, my, uh, 75 kilo lifter who jumps back pretty dramatically. Uh, and so, I mean, like, it's just, it's like Jess, every single video we post, at least one person's got a comment about her bent arms. Every single video we post of Amy, someone's got a comment about her jumping back. And it's usually some fucking ding dong, you know, man who snatches 40 kilos and, you know, has all this incredible insight about weightlifting to share with us. But anyway... Uh, Ursula, why don't you take this one to begin with? Okay. So I don't, I'm going to, I'm going to start with dick. the example that I had, um, go. and in terms of somewhat of a correction, but you also have to keep in mind that there's this idea that, you know, lifters have idiosyncrasies, like things that they do that don't negatively affect what they're lifting. And in fact, may positively affect what they're lifting that are, not textbook to like one of the, and actually jumping back is one of the four acceptable curves uh, of the S curve that has been provided by, you know, sports science and literature. So it's not like jumping back in and of itself is not considered wrong as is jumping forward just a little bit. Neither of those are considered outside of uh, correct technique. There is, you know, the most efficient way, which would, which would keep someone in the same spot. But that most efficient way for some person may not provide the biggest result. And as a coach, our goal is to provide the biggest result. I had, I worked with Chad Vaughn for a period of time. And when I first started training, uh, it was 06 when he moved down to Texas. He had a jump back that was more than a foot. I mean, it was exaggerated. It was extreme. His, um, one could have said at that point in time, well, he's a high level lifter. He's already made an Olympic team. He's, he's, uh, that's, that's okay for him because of the disparity between a snatch and clean and jerk. I decided that we should try to minimize it, not get rid of it, just minimize it. And so, um, the root of his jump back was really that he was bringing his shoulders back prematurely, causing his extension to have to lay back quite a bit creating some loop on the bar, and then he'd have to jump back to find it. The thing is, with really athletic people, they will find the bar no matter where it is, forward, middle, back. Um, but it was inconsistent. And for me, the biggest issue was that he had wrist pain. And there was always a, still a little bit of uh, horizontal velocity on the bar when he would catch it. So that loop didn't fall straight down onto him when he caught it. If they're creating a bar path and when they catch it, the bar is landing straight on them in a way that they could rebound straight out of it. It's not really an error. It's a little inefficient in that they're having to displace the bar further, but they may be able to create more power with their torso and ma the mass that they have in doing that. So it's not uncommon to see lifters who use a lot of extension or a longer layback in their extension to jump back a little bit. 
And this is one of the ways as they're driving through the ground that they can create more power. So what I look for specifically is how big is that jump back? Half a foot length back is not considered out of the norm. So you're looking at, are they jumping more than half a foot length back? The second thing I look for is, is there any additional upper body stress that's being caused? Like, are they rocking to their heel because the bar is pushing them back when they catch it? If that's happening, now we might need to do something about how they're extending to make sure that the bar is landing straight on them because we're looking at injury prevention and longevity of the lifter that uh, would be affected because of this repeated um, abuse on the wrist, elbow, shoulder, and having to stop the bar from going back. Um, how much is okay? I answered that. How do I stop doing it? Um, well, let, let me add a couple well, of things on here okay. before we go to the how do I stop doing it. Uh, I would agree with everything Ursula said, although I would actually say that the half a foot length back, I'd say that that's a good general guideline. But I wouldn't necessarily say that as an absolute limit um, and, a, you know, a black and white rule. Uh, right. Because I think I think the more important issue is exactly what she said, is that if the the body which includes the feet the whole body including the feet and the bar all come back equally they all come back together as one unit and the lifter is uh in the receiving position is directly under that bar the bar is coming straight down onto them and it's stable then I, i'm not going to worry about it i mean if, if they're trying to jump three feet back i don't think that's even possible so it's it's self-limiting to a large degree because if you if you do start going back a lot more than half a foot length or so, then you know meeting that criterion is going to be basically impossible anyway. So it, it is really self limiting. Um, but absolutely, and this is one of those things where people say, "Well, like, should I jump back? And will it be better for me?" And my answer is always, if you're the kind of lifter for whom uh, you know the kind of pull that causes a backward jump is going to be the most effective, it's going to happen naturally. It's not something you should try to do. It's not something you need to work on. Um, if anything, it is something like Ursula was talking about with Chad and like what I'm doing with Amy is you you basically exploit that. You know, you, you take advantage of that because that's obviously, obviously something that works well for the lifter, but you have to control it and refine it and make sure that you find that the, the optimum balance between, you know, whatever it is about that pull uh, balance and movement and bar trajectory that works for them without getting beyond that threshold where it starts creating problems and actually limits how much help that's doing. Um, I mean, Chad so, at the end always still jumped back. Right. It wasn't that, like I tried to take out the jump back. I yeah, just exactly. tried to minimize it to minimize the stress um, on his joints yeah, and, and make sure I that think, he was jumping where the bar, jumping back only to where the bar was going. Right, and that's a mistake I think people make is is they want to try to completely in, eliminate these like idiosyncrasies of certain lifters when those things are actually legitimately beneficial for those lifters. So it, mm -hmm. it is a matter of determining like, hey, is this just a straight up error that needs to be corrected or is it something that's actually benefiting these lifter in some way and we need to just make them do it as well as possible. And yeah, so like with technique? Chad, that's you. With Amy, that's true. Um, I jump backwards too, but now the, the other thing to keep in mind here is, is that a lot of times what people see as a jump back isn't actually a jump back, it's just the feet moving back, and that is definitely a problem, because the result of that is basically the same as the bar going forward. What happens is, you know, the, the bar and the body move backward, you know, to whatever extent, or excuse me, kind of stay in the same place, and then the feet actually move backward. So when the feet reconnect with the ground, uh, the base isn't directly under, you know, the balance point of the bar body yeah. system. And so that's the same, it, the same effect as the bar going forward and being out in front of the lifter. In other words, the, the lifter can't support the weight. Or you have something where, like Ursula was saying, you, you have an issue where it's, it's kind of crashing down in front and the lifter is having to adjust and rock back and pull the bar back which of course is difficult for stability and, and makes the lifts less consistent and less likely to be successful. But also you, you add a bunch of unnecessary stress to all your joints, all the way down to the hips and the ankles, ankles, especially in that situation. Um, and so you want to try to fix that. And so a lot of times what's happening there is 
it's not necessarily that the lifter has the weight too far back on the feet. Uh, a lot of times it's because the lifter is just losing that connection with the ground uh, during the pull too soon. In other words, if, if they're the whole time they're extending their hips, if they're continuing to drive with their legs, they're maintaining that pressure uh, of the foot against the ground. So they're, they're basically anchored to the floor. If they release that pressure by not driving with the legs long enough, then, you know, in that extended position, your body essentially thinks it's going to fall over on its ass. So it's going to sweep the feet back to kind of replace the base under where it feels like the body is going, even if that's not necessarily true. And so you end up with the body kind of staying in place, but the feet moving too far back or the body and bar may move back, but the feet move back farther. And so making sure that you're maintaining that drive and maintaining that pressure against the ground throughout the entire hip extension. Um, and the connection to the bar. Because right. you're moving as a unit. Right, but that's an unrelated issue we'll get to in a second. <laughs> <laughs> you had too much coffee. Hold on. Uh, Hold on. And so in making sure when you when you lift and, and move your feet from that pulling position to the receiving position that you're actually lifting your feet up. And usually what happens is in this case is that people bend at the knee only. They don't bend at the hip. And so if you if you picture this in your head, if you have someone who's in an extended position and in order to lift their feet, they just bend at the knee, that means the feet swing backward on the leg, you know, pivoting around the knee. If instead they flex at the hip as if they're doing a squatting motion, the knees go up and the feet trail behind them, which means that the feet will more likely stay directly under the body and you end up landing flat footed and in a good squat position directly under the bar. So a few different things to pay attention to and make sure that, you know, if you say, well, I'm jumping back, make sure you actually are jumping back and not just that you're sweeping your feet back and then resettling uh, with that weight. Uh, I, but get, yeah. I get lifters doing that sometimes, like if they're just tired, it's like they just jump back from underneath the bar. It makes me think they don't want to do the lift. Well, they don't, but that, that's a good point though, because if your legs are super tired, you're not going to have that uh, that vertical pop with your legs. You're going to cut that pole short and basically try to sneak under it. And it's just like doing a deadlift. If you're tired or if it's really heavy, it's actually going to feel easier to kind of sit back, like pull the bar back toward your heels and you almost just kind of pry it up with your body rather than what you need to do in a snatch and a clean, which is, you know, kind of stay over the whole foot and, and stay over the bar until you explode at the top. And so if you have someone who is tired, they're beat up from training, you're going to see that more often. And I, I'm, I would be willing to bet that happened uh, for you with Chad and it happens with Amy all the time when she, her legs are really tired, that jump back gets worse and the bar goes up a lot less. And she goes back a lot more and kind of sneaks under it, kind of squishes herself under the bar instead of really pulling directly under it. Yeah, I see it with lifters who don't even like normally jump back. Sometimes they like they usually move up and down and the feet out. But then when they're tired or if it's a heavy weight and they're a little scared, oh, they, yeah. they jump themselves back out from underneath the bar. Yeah, and you it's can a, it's see the same that as pushing too, yourself yeah. back away from a jerk. If you're not confident, you're not going to put yourself directly into the bar because that's scary. Um, but yeah, you, as you were saying with the maintaining that, that connection to the bar and that proximity of the bar in the body, that's a big part of it too. You know, you do need to open up the hips and kind of get that trunk back out of the way, especially if you have big boobs. Uh, but if, if you're not actively controlling that relationship of the bar and the body and, and keeping those things as close to each other as possible, then even if you don't jump back, the bar and the body are going to want to drift away. And so making sure the mechanics of that third pole uh, are sound and that you're you know equally aggressive and active in that as you are with the rest of the lift is going to help minimize the problems too. Well, in that bar proximity, like a lot of people talk about, you know, activating the lats and they think about like keeping the bar close from the ground to the hip. And then they kind of lose that idea over as they pull under. Yeah. And you'll see like the wrist flick out and the elbow turn out as opposed to the wrist in and the elbow up. And it's because they've like loosened the, the, the lack in the shoulder and let the bar kind of fling at the top. But if you are still squeezing a little through the lat, then the bar should stay close as you finish that movement. And as if you jump back a little bit, it will take the bar with you. Right. Yeah, I, I honestly, I think people 
get overly focused on the whole lat idea and, and keeping the bar close during that first pull and even during the second pull because you, you you really have to be excessively forward with the shoulders in front of the bar or be way up on your toes to get any significant distance of the bar. I mean, if, if it starts pulling you forward, it's going to pull you forward and, and you'll still stay close, but it's because you're falling into the bar. Right. Pressure's but the, the the far, far, far bigger issue is during that third pull. That's when the bar gets away from people. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's easy to keep a bar close to you in the first pull. You just don't get too far over the bar. You just freaking stand up. Uh, you know, and like we, you've, you've used the word, uh, well, we'll, we'll keep coining the term Ursula's pendulum. Um, but it is a pendulum The you know, the bar is attached to the shoulders through the arms, wherever the shoulders go, the bar is going to want to follow eventually. So if the shoulders start going too far forward, the bar is going to want to swing forward. If the shoulders are directly above the bar, the bar is going to stay directly below the shoulders. Um, and you know, if it's, the shoulders are only slightly in front of the bar, like I believe they should be during that pull, then there isn't some huge dramatic, uh, force pulling that bar forward. It's not some crazy thing you've got to, you know, prepare for as if you're playing tug of war with the fucking universe. Um, All right. So, well, that's the thing you see people fighting the bar. It's like, you're not being the ball, Danny. Yeah. You have to become one with the bar. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Zen and the art of the third pole. Uh, okay, so how do I stop doing it? Um, that depends on why you're doing it. And so if it's just the feet moving back, I gave you a couple ideas there of, of why you might be doing it and, and how to fix that. Um, but so if, if it's just a general, basically if you're jumping backwards, for one reason or another, somehow to some extent, your weight is being directed too far back relative to the foot. Would you agree with that very general statement? Mm-hmm. If you're going forward, it's because your weight is too far forward to the feet. If you're going backward, it's because your weight is too far back over the foot. Um, but like Ursula said, with regard to Chad, if you're opening your hips too soon, you're getting your shoulders behind the bar way too soon. Um, that's one reason that you could be shifting back. And so obviously the correction is to learn how to better time your, your second pull and stay over the bar longer. But if that's not happening, it could be that you're just trying to shift too far back towards your heels. And I I think this is really common these days because people have heard that heels cue, like get back on the heels so much, um, you know, with no context that, they are literally trying to get all the way back on their heels. And that's way too far back. You know, I I would say slightly more on the heels than on the balls of the feet, but that's slight. It's not so far back that your toes are coming up off the ground. It looks like you're water skiing. Uh, So what are your corrective suggestions for this here? Um, Well, I mean, if you're, first of all, there may not need them. There may no be it may well, not be a problem. Assuming so we've determined that assuming. it's a problem. So if we determine that it's a problem, I mean you could do just basic footwork to try to make sure that you're staying under the bar when you drop. So things like snatch balance might help you to see whether you know. You, I mean, just learning to stay in the same spot. That'll help you practice um, lifting which the is, knees and lifting the feet properly too. Mm-hmm. Right, um, and then I would go to. And we're going to talk about hip cleans, but uh, go to hip snatches and seeing if you're you can stay in the same. I have my favorite exercise ever, which is a hip muscle squat snatch, which gets you moving down and up, getting full extension and pulling yourself under without any movement of the feet. Um, so things that keep the feet planted, like muscle snatch, muscle squat snatch, hip muscle squat snatch, that'll help you really determine what your extension should be like for you to stay in one spot. Um, and if you can't, if you're really shitty at those exercises and when you do them, you tend to scooch back. Um, it may be that you're not pushing through the ground, but pushing against the ground, like horizontally. And that can cause that, that jump back too. So, I mean, I think that's how I would suggest really teaching them how to use pressure through the ground into full extension, um, as well as pulling under the bar straight under and making sure that your feet are moving straight to the side. And so muscle snatch as well as a snatch balance uh, should do that for you. Yeah, and, and I, I would say any snatch or clean from uh, kind of a higher hang position, 
Yeah. Like you said, uh, a hip snatch or, or a hip clean yeah. or snatch from power position or dip snatch or even like a snatch from mid thigh, then you're getting yourself set up in that basically that second pole position and learning how to establish that balance feeling being able to feel that pressure over the foot the way it should be um and then you know learning how to finish in a way that doesn't direct everything too far back and then also simple stuff like a snatch pull plus snatch or a clean pull plus clean where you can really focus on that uh, vertical drive of the legs at the top of the pole and then try to mimic that in the actual lift that follows um or you know if you're really struggling doing things like a snatch deadlift plus snatch or even a halting snatch deadlift plus snatch where you're you're not only learning to feel that balance on the way up but then you're also learning to stay over the bar uh longer things like that so i mean break it down to whatever you know level of fundamentalness that you need uh and then build back up from there did we cover it I think sounds good. All right. Okay. Uh, let's see. Can't pronounce this name wrong. JD asks <laughs> for beginners. I was trying to think of a way to pronounce it long, and then I just gave up. Uh, for beginners be transitioning from a powerlifting slash bodybuilding split, how frequent should the lifter program clean and jerk and snatch a week? And uh, we were joking before the show, and I said anywhere from uh, one to seven days per week. For each lift. All right, next question. Yeah. I'm just kidding, JD. <laughs> we'll actually try to be helpful. Um, uh, it. I, I would say this. The, the simple answer is the more frequently you can practice any skill, the more quickly you're going to master it. Now, that, that's just pretty general learning advice. Um the issue, of course, is that, you know, you can practice the piano for 12 hours a day every single day. And yeah, it's going to suck. And maybe you're, you get a little arthritic and stuff like that, but it's not going to kill you. You can't snatch and clean and jerk 12 hours a day, seven days a week, because you actually might die. Um, so there is a limit to what you can do. And of course, there are other training things you need to do in that week. But if you can have exposure to the snatch, the clean, the jerk, or some variation thereof every training day in a week that you have, that's probably going to do you good uh, as long as you're not overdoing it and digging yourself into a big, deep, uh, you know, biological hole. Well, right? and I guess you would, yeah, you would say you, you can snatch and clean and jerk in some form and should, I think, every day, some portion of the lift because you're, as you said, learning a skill. Um, but it doesn't mean you're going to try to do it heavy. Right. I think, you know, when you're learning a skill, you work with weights that are well under what you can do. So if I can do it for potentially six reps, I do it for three uh, and, and make sure that I'm doing it correctly. I mean, if you're transition, any beginner transitioning from anything, regardless of where they're coming from, um, should just focus on developing the skill and not be so concerned with, how much weight is on the bar until the skill has been developed. And I think when you put the word powerlifting or bodybuilder in front of that, it creates the potential for someone who's used to lifting a lot of weight to try to learn the skill with a lot of weight. And that would be a mistake. Well, it also uh, makes me think that there's very likely going to be some mobility limitations. Mobility, yeah. Sure. Uh, in which case, the more frequent your exposure to those movements, uh, the faster that mobility is going to improve. Uh, you know, you're, you're basically doing active flexibility work every time you do a snatch clean or jerk yeah. or variation. Uh, and so in that case, it's, 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 again, really important to get that frequent exposure. But, you know, let's, let's say that, uh, you know, you're, you're brand new to it. Like you literally just learned how to snatch and clean and jerk yesterday. Um, I, me personally, I think a good way to do it is to, you know, each training day kind of have a snatch focus or a clean focus or a jerk focus or a clean and jerk focus. Um, and I mean, this is something that that's not like my idea. This is, you know, goes back to most learning stuff, but also it's, um, you know, like a lot of the old, uh, Soviet recommendations and stuff, the same kind of thing where, 
you're you're focusing on that single lift and those related skills. So if you're snatching, you're doing you know some kind of snatch variation. Maybe you're doing snatch pulls or snatch deadlift. You're doing overhead squat. You know that sort of stuff. So you, neurologically, you're you're learning all these similar and related skills rather than trying to learn three very different things like snatch clean and jerk all in one day and when you're more right. you know proficient then that's not really a big deal snatching and clean and jerking on the same day is not only not a problem it's actually beneficial in a lot of ways uh, at least some of the time uh, so I, I would say that so you can alternate you know monday is snatch day wednesday is clean day uh, you know, Thursday is jerk day and then Saturday is snatch and clean and jerk or something like along those lines where you, you are getting exposure to each lift multiple times a week. Um, and you're, you're able to kind of focus on a single lift. Now, I mean, having said that you could also do both lifts, you know, every single day you train if you really wanted to, but I would still have one that was emphasized more than another. So for example, you know, on Monday, Monday's really your snatch day. So you, you spend a bunch of time with the snatch or a snatch variation, snatch pulls, overhead squats. And then maybe you do at the end, you do some really light power clean and power jerk, you know, something along those lines where it, it's in there. So you're getting some exposure to it, but you're not, you're not spending equal time and effort on both. Well, and you're doing a simpler version of it, right? Like you're not doing its entire entirety. So you could do like a power clean push press or something to, you know, just work on bar path from the jerk. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I would say that in general and and like Ursula were talking and I were talking earlier, you know, both of us at this point, I mean, we'll, we'll snatch and clean and jerk each, you know, maybe once or twice a week because we already know how to snatch and clean and jerk. That's not necessarily something we have to learn. Um, I just need to get stronger and, and less injured. Uh, you know, so there's, I, there's different things to be done yeah. at my age, you know, trying to make get you know, maintain speed or get, try to get faster. So I, I do, um, a bit more power snatching now than I ever did when I actually competed. Oh, I hate power uh, snatches. I know. And I hate, um, Full snatches. No, that's not true. I love full snatches. Uh, jerks hurt my shoulder quite a bit. So if I'm going to jerk, I know I'm going to kind of be out from overhead stuff for a while. So I have to plan like the day I do clean a jerk. If I do jerks out of the rack or something, or uh, I have to then know that the following workout, I'm just going to squat and pull because I'm going to have to give my shoulder a few days of rest. Um, and so maybe I'll do squat pulls and some bodybuilding stuff on on the next day after jerks and may and then go back to power snatching instead of full snatching, which also is a little bit more stress on my shoulder. I, I used to snatch balance quite a bit when I competed and was really good at it. Um, I'm not so good at it anymore and I probably need it more, but it again, like the jerk puts me out of commission for a couple of days. And I know that. So I have to kind of strategically place full snatch, full clean and jerk, jerk and or snatch balance in a way that I, I know that afterward, the, the next workout's going to be their bodybuilding workout or, you know, pull squats and bodybuilding type workout only. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you, you know, you get for a beginner, it's that you're in a different place. And, and when you're a, a, an elite lifter, you're in a different place. And then when you're an old elite lifter, <laughs> Yeah. Formerly elite. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, just to summarize real quick, I would say at, at your stage, do at least one of the lifts or a variation of one of the competition lifts every single day you train at minimum, because you do want to get a lot of exposure to them and a lot of practice and, and they need to be, they need to become things that you're not thinking about. You're just able to do. Uh, second and you want to focus on accuracy and precision, not just getting them in. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I feel like that should go without saying, but it, it absolutely yeah, does but, need to know, be said. Right. Every single rep you do is practice. So practice the way that you would want them to end up being in the future as good as you can possibly do them at this stage. They're not going to be perfect because if they were perfect, you wouldn't be a beginner or you wouldn't be a human being. Um, but do, do the best you can each one because that's going to speed up the process quite a bit. All right. Um, my goal for this next one is to not sound like an absolute asshole. 
So good luck. <clears throat> yeah, no, I'm usually every time I have that goal, I'm usually pretty confident that I'm gonna fail. All right, but I'm feeling good today. Uh, you have to say it before you do it. I don't mean to insult you, but, but well, those. no, I don't. I'm I'm not at all gonna. Uh, I have no intention at all of insulting Tyler here. Uh, well, nor no, do I, Tyler. nor do I think any less of him for asking this question. That's of not the issue. Of course not. It's not his fault. No. All right, Tyler. Tyler asks, "What is the advantage of hip cleaning? Who is it right for? Does one's anatomy lead them to be a better hip cleaner? From what I have seen, hip cleaning is an American technique that is not used often in other countries. Why is that? I mean, first of all, as Ursula and I discovered, we need to clarify this terminology um, because she and I both come from a world in which." The term hip clean is an exercise, a variation of a clean in which you're cleaning, uh, you know, from the hang with the bar starting at the quote unquote hip, which really for a clean is going to be upper thigh. Uh, but what Tyler is asking about is a, a strictly American named thing, which is a clean, in other words, from the floor, full clean in which the lifter is intentionally bending the elbows and pulling the bar up into the hips in the finish rather than allowing the bar to contact uh, you know the upper thighs as it would naturally with someone with you know kind of average regular length arms yeah <laughs> someone who's just regular uh, so I'll say this. What is the advantage of hip cleaning? Well, the advantage of hip cleaning is that the bar contacts at the hip, which is a really convenient place for the bar and body to connect. Um, you know, one of the tricky parts of the clean is that because the narrower grip places the bar a little lower on the body, you know, the, the upper thighs, or if you're Donovan Ford, pretty much at the knee, because his arms, <laughs> his arms are like... He can tie his shoes just, without leaning over. I just over. want to say that Donovan Ford is red carpet material, and I stick to that. He, I agree, but you can't. It's a, it's an anatomical fact that he has arms that are his. You know, your the the average proportion. Gotcha. Your wingspan is supposed to be about equal to your height. I think he, he's like five nine, and his wingspan is like six two or something crazy like that. So it, his arms are dramatically longer. Than you would expect them to be, which means that bar hits much lower inside. But anyway, uh, so in that case, when that bar is going to contact the thighs, you know, during that second pull, the knees are moving forward as the body adjusts and that torso comes into a vertical position, which means that if you know if the bar is contacting at the level of the thighs, it's going to tend to be pushed forward a little bit away from the trunk, which means it's a little, it's a tougher interaction of the bar and the body and, and to control that and keep the bar close and to not allow that bar to drag and slow down and get displaced and all these other things. So that is the only advantage of, of this hip clean technique, not the exercise, um, because it, it you avoid any of that interaction of the bar with the thighs and, and skip that whole thigh area and just go right to the, uh, the hip. Anything you need to add on that particular point? I do. Um, okay. So if you're talking about intentionally bending your arms into a position that is not a position that you actually would move through during the lift, my sense of its application to the clean is fucking zero <laughs> because that is not what you're actually going to do in the lift. Well, now, you're, so getting, you're, now just, you're getting ahead of yourself. Okay, but go ahead. I'm not. I'm, I'm where I'm at. <laughs> so you've, and, you've been holding um, this in this whole time, haven't you? I was. I said you've been, been holding this in. I have. I have. I didn't interrupt. I just bottled it up and it's exploding. <laughs> um, the whole idea, let's let's just get into why real elite lifters, not pseudo American elite lifters, but real elite lifters bend their arms at their hip is for preservation of momentum. And if you've already stopped the bar at your hip, and you bent your arms to go from there, you're not even utilizing it in the way that an expert or proficient or a, an internationally elite level athlete would use the bend of the arm. Like the bend of the arm is so that in the transition from 
when you're bending your knees and going into the upright torso position to jump, there would be a natural deceleration at that point. And by bending your arms slightly as you transition, the bar would continue to move so you would decelerate less. That's the only reason one would acceptably bend their arms. And if you're a good level lifter, you might detect this and be able to do it. But it's contingent on doing the entire lift for it to be uh, practiced. If you just stand up and go with the bar around your knees and settle it into your hips and feel like, oh, I can do a lot of weight there, well, that's great. Do a lot of weight there. But it doesn't necessarily transition into what you're doing in the lift unless you know how to do the motion from the top of the thigh into the hip where you have the transition position that requires this preservation of momentum in order to minimize deceleration of the bar. So in that case, we're not looking at an applicability of this movement to the actual lift. You would be better off going from your power position where you're actually going to go from in your actual lift or wherever you would actually contact in the real lift. Also, if you don't know how to bend your arms correctly to preserve moment, momentum, then you're really just intercepting the, the, the speed of the bar. And you don't want to do that either. So that's what I have to say. <laughs> well, I, I uh, con conveniently uh, yeah. enough, I agree with that, except I, I would specify that in my opinion, uh, and I've made a video about this, written an article about it, said it multiple times in all these channels. Uh, the, a, a bend in the arms, a, a slight bend in the arms is okay with me if it's occurring naturally, if it's not the result of a preceding error, if it's not excessive. So, you know, uh, 10 degrees or so is, is the rule that I took from the Soviet literature. Um, and if it's not causing any subsequent problems and 90% of the people who do this in the U S are doing it intentionally, uh, as a technique. So that, that one doesn't work for me. Uh, the other people, the people who are not doing it intentionally are doing it, um, basically at, in response, unconscious response to an error, such as being out of balance forward or beginning the second pull way too soon. Uh, and third, most people who are doing it intentionally, they're creating more problems with it. So uh, the article I wrote was arm bend in the snatch and clean. It's still not the solution to your bad lifting. In other words, this is a technique that some people are promoting that absolutely will not fix your shitty snatch and clean. It's not going to help you learn, learn, like, you know, figure out what the actual problems with your lift is and correct those problems. Don't add some weird thing on top of it so that it goes from being shitty to super shitty. Uh, you know what I mean? Trust that, you know, the body is going to adjust in a way, um, that will help you produce the most effective movement possible. If you are teaching it the basics. If you're nailing down those fundamentals, your balance and your timing, your body will adjust a little bit. So you're going to see most people are going to have a little bit of bend in the elbows in the finish of the clean because the body naturally wants to help that bar avoid the thighs. Um, you know, that higher contact point is, is going to help, again, like Ursula said, that preserves that existing bar speed during the transition. But it also makes the bar body interaction uh, much less complex, which is going to help preserve speed and help preserve bar trajectory and all those things. But that's a thing that your body does naturally. Once you start introducing this intentional arm bend, you get all kinds of issues. And I, Ursula, you mentioned it, kind of alluded to it, knowing how to bend the arms properly. In other words, if you let it occur naturally, that your elbows are going to stay, your arms are going to stay internally rotated. So your elbows are going to stay directed outward. Uh, whereas if you're doing this intentionally, I, I would say pretty much 100% of the time, what you're going to see is those elbows are pulling back right and tight to the body. And that's creating problems with staying connected to the bar and having an active, controlled, precise turnover and receipt of the clean rather than flipping the bar up into the air, falling down under it, and then hoping it crashes down onto you in the right position and doesn't kill you. Um, 
So, I want to say one thing. No, you say There's as many things as you between, want. I do usually. There's <laughs> a difference between staying connected and hindering the flight of the bar. So like you're staying connected to the bar. So there's some, you know, your arm has some tension in it, but you should be allowing the flight of the bar. So the speed of the bar so that the bar is, um, propul you know, gets thrown up in the air as you pull under. Right. And you stay connected to the bars. So you don't just let it go and let it fly and become two moving entities. But that doesn't mean that you should be using your arms as a prime mover. And what happens, I see, when people put the bar intentionally in their hip and they try to go, they're not, it's, it's beyond active arms. It's too much arms. And that's a problem. Because when the bar is in flight, you don't want your arms to get in the way of the flight of the bar. And they actually will stop its progress if they're too tight. They should be really following the bar and its flight. Did you just and pound your desk with your fist as you said that? I may have. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> really drives the point home. It lends Anyways, you more I just gravitas. Wanted to add that instance. Yeah. So, yeah, Tyler, uh, I, I guess what we're saying is uh, who is it right for? No one. Um, it, I, I don't believe any human being who is snatching or clean and jerking, uh, or I guess it's, this is you're asking specifically about the clean needs to do this now the thing is is uh you you say does one's anatomy lend them to be a better hip cleaner one's anatomy will uh influence how much the body does this naturally absolutely if you have someone with a short torso and long arms that means the bar you know i use donovan as an example the bar is going to contact the legs much lower which makes it a lot trickier so many times you're going to see someone built like that you're going to see that body naturally bend the elbows a little bit more to help bring that bar somewhat higher and kind of avoid the thighs. But again, let it happen naturally. Don't, don't make this thing occur. It, to me, it's, it's, it's no different really than saying, yeah, at the top of a pole, you should come up onto your toes, but you're not doing an intentional calf raise. You're not intentionally plantar flexing your, your ankles. That's just part of that motion that naturally is coupled with, you know, aggressive uh, leg and hip extension, you know, driving through the floor. So let it happen, and then it's going to happen correctly if everything else is done correctly. Focus on those things, balance, timing, and you know pos uh, posture. And then if that occurs, it's probably going to be fine. Um, and so this is, you see this, you say, is this an American technique? Or it seems like an American technique that's not used often in other countries. It's not used in other countries intentionally. A lot of you know non-American lifters do bend their elbows when they clean and even when they snatch sometimes. But again, it's not some technique that they're doing intentionally, uh, I would say, except in some very, very rare cases, uh, which, you know, those exceptions certainly don't prove the rule. Um, so just just be yourself. Let your body determine what works better once you've taught it the basics and, and don't get carried away with these crazy, uh, in you know, tricks. And it, it listen, if a technique comes with a hashtag or something, then it's probably a good idea to not do it. <laughs> In reference to anthropometrics and grip, so if you have short arms, which is what you you were the antithesis of Donovan Donovan. Yeah. Um, and you have Donathan. or and or <laughs> Donathan, or if you have a, a little bit wider grip, it could be that when you stand upright with the bar, the bar is at your hips. But your arms are straight. And that's, I think, the difference. So if I'm at my hip because, and my arms are straight because I'm built like T-Rex, then cleaning from the hip, it, that, that is my power position. Right. Right? So and that's, that would be the only, you know, kind of given but, exception. But, that but that's, not a, that's not a hip just, clean, though. That's just a clean because that person right, is not intentionally right. rowing the bar to the hip. So yeah. if you do happen to have... Uh, proportions in which a clean grip places the bar right around your hip, you're psyched. You're going to have a really yeah, great you're... time doing cleans and good for you. Uh, most people are not going to be in that position. But the thing is, you're going to pay for that ability with uh, probably a relative limitation in the snatch. You'll be a better clean and jerker than snatcher. So it's going to come bite you in the ass one way or the other. 
Um, but the yeah, the thing that, is for me is that you know I use the word hip clean in programming, and I mean a power position clean. Yeah, of course. I don't want anybody to bend their arms prematurely to get the bar into the hip. And I mean, I'm just kind of upset about right now that this word <laughs> has gotten redefined in some way that is not what the way I use it. Yeah, guys, if you're and going I, to invent I'm, some I'm terminology, make sure it doesn't already exist for something totally and clear different. clear it with me. Clear. Yeah, check in with Ursula. And uh, it's like registering a copyright or a trademark. That's you right. Gotta, you got to do a search do. first and make sure there's no no uh, competing use. Yeah, like I have a Pop and Drea pool and a Garza get up. Uh, Nobody else has them. What's the Garza get up where you like lift your legs really high and then fling them down so you can stand up? No, you're not supposed ground? to fling at all. <laughs> you're supposed to be, but that's how people do it. You're supposed to be lying flat on your back with a barbell overhead. And then you pull like you're doing a pullover, the bar forward, and then you pull your body in underneath the bar into an, a full overhead squat. And then when you hit your bottom position, you stand up. That's what it's supposed to be. I do you know what do the them. Everett getup is? Getting out of a chair, the toilet. No, that's that's getting out of bed in the morning where you actually you do a wrestler's bridge. So you bridge up on your head to kind of generate a little uh, uh, leverage, <laughs> and then you can the roll rest. over to sit up more easily. Oh yeah, I'm gonna have to try that. It's all you gotta you gotta learn how to use momentum and leverage more than that's uh, right to get effort. up. Yeah. No abs. It's all technique. Yep. <clears throat> all right. Um, well, I think that we helped Erland, we helped JD, and we made Tyler sad. No, actually, Tyler. Trust us, we helped you. And we probably helped a lot of people. And then we, we did make a few people unhappy. I can't wait. Can for I the, mention something I can't wait for that the I'm Instagram doing? post in response. Yeah. I'm um, on February 4th here in Austin. Actually, it's in Leander. We have a competition called the Iron Bromance. <laughs> Catchy. Yeah. It's the, we we normally do it every year and it's usually a sort of invitational where we get together and we do you know a, like a little snatch and clean and jerk clinic and then we do this is the old format and then we would do like a heavy lifting day and then for like the three people that wanted to wad out of that group they would do a wad did you uh, just use by wad that as a verb I, yes i'm gonna, we're yes, canceling this entire podcast I'm, I'm deleting it all. God damn it, so, Ursula. What what I'm doing um, instead, because I hate cardio, is I and I know a bunch of people who do who hate cardio, um, is we're doing a a competition, and it's you know the snatch, clean, and jerk as separate movements, uh, and each movement is then coupled with a barbell uh, challenge. Um, so it's an all all barbell. Um, basically sh testing strength and muscular endurance um, in a way that is acceptable to me. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's a competition. So it, if you like heavy lifting um, and you want to challenge yourself, uh, look on my Facebook page, which is Ursula Garza Papandrea, or on my Instagram, and I have a link, which I'm now going to have to replace with the podcast link for a while. Um, well, wait, to, what's, uh, your, what's your Instagram name? My Instagram? Yep. Well, if you want to Instagram me, uh, <laughs> it's at Texas Barbell Club. Okay. Yeah. That's much that's shorter good. than Ursula Garza Papandrea. I like it. Well, that's on Facebook. You can just put Ursula Garza. It'll pop up. But on uh, – on, uh, actually, I, and I have a Weightlifting Wise and Texas Barbell Club Facebook page, but – I never do anything with it. And I actually have, you know, my weightlifting wise, uh, website and people ask my friends all the time. Does she ever update that? The answer is obviously no. If you're asking the question. <laughs> so seriously. Yeah. All so, right. but we're doing that competition. So if you're interested, you can, uh, my email is weightlifting wise at gmail.com. You can, uh, send me an email and I'll forward you the link. But uh, it's here. In, it's here in right north of Austin, in Leander, Texas, on February fourth, and it's meant to kind of coincide with Valentine's Day, hence the name Iron Bromance. But it'll All be a right. lot of fun. Cool. And you won't have to run a row or burpee. No burpees. That sounds like a pretty good deal. Yep. 
All right, guys. Uh, once again, please take a minute and go uh, rate and review this show on iTunes. Or I don't even know if you can do it on Google Play. I don't use that. Uh, but I'm sure there's some equivalent to rating and reviewing on Google Play, just like iTunes. Uh, do that for us if you like it. We really appreciate it. Um, check out our seminars. Check out Ursula's Meet. Check out all of our stuff on CatalystAthletics.com because it'll make you a better person and give you uh, more to contribute to the world. So do do your civic duty and check out CatalystAthletics.com. Be American. Be patriotic. That's right. All right, guys. We will talk to you next time in another like six months, it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. See ya. All right. See ya.